Thanks, Adam. Um, I actually have an alternative, alternate title for this. Uh, I like to call it uh, experimenting on your uh, customers, treating them as if they were lab rats, because that's kind of what we end up doing. Now, we've all been in these uh, situations where uh, we're all sitting around the table with the graphic designers and the UX people and the geeks and the neckbeards, and we're all arguing about what button should we have that will uh, get our customers to agree to click that button and buy the product, right? And uh, of course, we ask for help from the product management and eh, not much help. It's always whatever gets the product out first. That's all that matters. You know, one thing uh, we've noticed is that sometimes these uh, battles become kind of epic, right? And, uh, and, and loud. But after some time, the, uh, the process gets to the point where we get rid of all of the bad ideas like having the button and cling on. It's not going to help much. And we whittle it down to two possible ideas. Now, out of these, there's one problem with this situation because there's somebody that's missing from our table that probably should be there, and that's the customer, right? Where is the customer? And do you really know your customer? I mean, once upon a time, um, when I started out in this industry, that was in the previous century, uh, we used to have these uh, potential customers come in, we'd plop them down and behind a computer, and then we'd stare at them while they used the product, see if this would make any difference. Yeah, it wasn't very effective. We never got enough people. We always bribed them with jelly donuts, which never made it, uh, made them very, uh, made, you often made them sick afterwards, so it didn't work out so well. Now what we're doing, it seems like, is asking for surveys. Um, really? I mean, I think my time is worth a little bit more valuable to me, no matter how much you beg. I mean, the least you can do is give me a free backpack. And then once you do get these, uh, these surveys, I mean, really? Is your website easy to use? Do you very strongly disagree? It's like, what does that really mean? So what we now do is we take our customers, we split them into two types of groups, and then we show them both ideas and see which one works out. This is what we call multivariate testing, split testing, A-B testing. It's got lots of different names, but it's the same kind of idea. So, uh, what I would like to do is, is go through the three primary aspects of testing and how you organize it based on starting off with your plans and your goals, getting out to actually testing the customer, and then uh, reporting and analysis on that. Afterwards, uh, I'll go through some variations on this, uh, these themes, some tools, and some tips that uh, I've run across. And the uh, first part's a little conceptual, but uh, don't worry, we'll get into some code pretty quick, and I'll try to keep that code a little light. A uh, little disclaimer, I am not a mathematician, and uh, when I started, it didn't seem to matter much. I mean, back then, we used to shoot fast and from the hip. Yeah, and then the math guys started to show up, you with their calculators and their formulas and, you know, made us feel kind of insignificant. They were always trying to get us to do things that we didn't quite understand. I mean, really, what's a p-value? I don't know. I mean, personally, I can't even pronounce sadistics, much less uh, know much about it. So uh, I'm going to kind of tailor this to what uh, we can do on the client, uh, specifically uh, with jQuery and jQuery plugins. Now, if on the other hand, you did enjoy your sadistics class, there's a lot of late night evenings you could spend analyze, analyzing this stuff. All right, so to begin, uh, always start your test with a very clear goal. So first off, uh, is your whole company on board? Does the executives want you to be doing this? If not, uh, I recommend uh, Wired had an article last December uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, it's online, so make sure everybody's on board because it's going to take a little bit of time and it may cause you some hiccups along the way. Uh, second, try to think what kind of problems you're really having with your website and your, and your application before you start just 
testing uh, randomly. And also make sure your tools work. Can't stress this enough. I recommend doing what's called an AA test where you do everything uh, possible, but you actually don't show the customer anything different, just to make sure that everything's in place before you start going down that path. Now, to be a, make an effective test, you have to have a goal. And when I talk about a goal, that goal has to have a test that can uh, be measured to reach that goal. So, answer me these questions three. Air the other side, you see. What? is your primary goal or purpose. And by this, I mean your primary goal for the whole website. I mean, you're trying to sell a product, you're trying to get people to sign up for your newsletter. Um, have that in mind as you go through and think about how you're gonna get tests that will get you to that goal. Then what is your immediate goal? What is the uh, idea behind this particular test that's going to reach the bigger goal? For instance, uh, it's real easy for us to put those great little social media icons on our website, Facebook, Twitter, kind of buttons on. But are those being effective? It's very hard to tell if those buttons are really uh, getting you more revenue for your site, for instance. I mean, personally, every time I see those and I click on them, I spend the next hour looking at kitten pictures on Wowing, right? So you gotta test whether your, uh, your, your site abandonment, test to see how many people are actually leaving your site because of those buttons, and then try to validate that about with new people coming in. Then finally, you gotta measure it. How are you going to uh, verify that a test is actually working? You gotta make sure that the button that they click can get uh, measured as far as uh, getting reported. So be specific. There are lots of different kinds of tests that you could do. I'll go through uh, just two ideas. Um, people who are primarily on the server side like it if they could just generate duplicate copies of pages and then have uh, a routing table that can send the cu one customer to one page or the other. We're all front end people, so that uh, seems like you're repeating yourself. So often what we'll do is use some, you know, uh, jQuery magic in order to just change part of the look and feel based on the customer. Now the big question is how long do you run a test for? You got two questions to go through and they're really just uh, two sides of the same coin because how much data you collect is due to how long you run the test and how long you run the test is, well, did you collect enough data? So let's pretend here uh, that this is a real graph and that the x-axis is time and the y is the amount of data we've collected. So let's have red be our control. Uh, we'll normalize it based on our typical success rate so it's just a nice steady curve that'll make this illustration a little easier. Now the blue here is our initial results and as you can see it looks like this test is really performing well. So let's stop the test and make it so. Well, after we start collecting more and more data, we realize that, nah, this is really a false positive. The opposite could be said. You know, we can see something that's not performing very well, but that may be just a statistical anomaly. See, I told you I couldn't pronounce it. And uh, it could actually grow over time. So you want to make sure that you collect enough data so that you don't have things like false positives or negatives. So near the front of it, this is what we call insignificant. Collect enough data. Now how much? All, um, one of the advice that you constantly see online is uh, don't peek at your data. Just let it run until you have all the data you want. But that goes against human nature. So uh, I recommend that if you do peak, just don't stop it. Uh, you can use online calculators in case you're not really comfortable with uh, sadistics. Uh, you, there's a lot of them, they're online, they're, some of them are free. Uh, they'll tell you whether uh, your, your test is working, which one is more, uh, more likely to go for it. But more importantly, it'll tell you if you've got a big enough sample size. 
Some of them uh, allow you to get right into the nitty gritty details. And some of them you can actually use to do predictive analysis where you can put in how many customers you expect to be showing up and what's your conversion rate and how many tests. And it'll tell you how many days you should probably run the test. Now, once you've decided uh, about your test, you now need to kind of actually do the testing on the customers. It's a pretty straightforward thing. You just need to convert your customers to a number. Everybody feels like they love being a number. Then you just combine it with the test label, and then you just do a mod based on the number of groups, the number of tests you want to run. Now, this converting a customer to a number, I mean, this sounds like a hash, right? Well. Most of the hashes out there are uh, kind of geared more towards uh, uniqueness. We, call it, we care more about spread, making an even group, or as even as possible. So the first thing I did is I just wrote a quick little uh, formula to take a random string, convert each character into a number, add it all together, and call it good. And, uh, you know, it generally worked all right, but boy, Given it a goo, it comes up with a small number. That seems kind of wrong. You know, maybe it's too simple. So first thing I did was just kind of shift it a little bit. Yeah, that looks better. The number uh, now, uh, a big string gives me a big number. I like that. But I think maybe we should test that. So I grabbed about 10,000 pieces of data on various types, GUIDs, email addresses, even random words from a dictionary, just to run through and see how it would all work out. And uh, my simple hash, the first algorithm, hmm, doesn't look too bad. It looks like it split things up pretty decently. My shifted hash, on the other hand, looks like it's got bigger numbers there, group A and group B, and then I, the delta there is just the difference. Yeah, it really was. The simple one was a lot better. Hmm, who would have thunk, right? Well, the next thing you need to do is combine the customer number with a test label. Now, this makes sense once you start thinking about it. I mean, most tests are split right down the middle. You're testing half your customers against the other. Half of them are control. That's usually group A, and the other half are group B. Group A is the control. So, uh, you know, if you've got Fred who ends up with an ID that ends up getting converted to an odd number, he's always going to get tested. And that's not very effective. So if you combine it with a test label, then at least uh, you'll uh, alternate which people get the tests. So just take your uh, some sort of a string, add it with your user ID, and then do your, uh, your hashing algorithm. Now the problem with this, you can kind of look at this code and see, is that even IDs are always in the same group and odd IDs are always in the same. So they're either getting all tested or not. So kind of what I would like is, uh, like let's see, here's four people, two even, two odds. I'll represent them by color so I can illustrate it a little better. And I want two tests. And in the tests, I want to kind of split them up more like this. I want to put, uh, the red may be always in a control, and Wilma may get uh, in a control on one test, but be in the test group in another one. That's kind of how I'd like to do it, split things up. So first thing you do is you try to really blend those, uh, the, the test ID with the user's ID. Well, the problem with this, as you can tell, is that the critical last letter where the modulus shows up is going to be the longest string. Hmm, that's not so good. So let's go the other way. Well, now it's really going to be on the name string. That's not very good either. Well, if you look around, you'll find things uh, like the murmur hash. This one seems to be very good at distribution, the distribution of regular keys. So. I ran it through my same test just to see what would happen, and hey, it's interesting. Look at email address. Murmur hash did great. My simple hash, that was one uh, where it didn't split things up very evenly. Well, what about uh, having three groups? What if you've got two buttons and a control or something? Well, now an email address doesn't seem to work so well with the murmur hash. Now I should try murmur too. So I guess my... Uh, 
conclusion, if you could say, on distribution is just make sure you choose your hashing algorithm based on the types of IDs that you have with your customers. I mean, if you're storing them by email address, that may be different than if you're storing them by, um, uh, by just a unique number or GUID. And then just make sure you verify your assumptions. Now, a test isn't very valid unless you can report it. So, uh, and, and reporting kind of generally uh, requires a server component. You need to send a message back saying this test was actually triggered. Now, make sure you report both uh, that the test was shown as well as the test was triggered. Don't just kind of assume that they saw it. So usually I put code like this where um, once I've uh, decided that the user is in part of a test, then I'm going to uh, send a, a notification uh, tracking uh, that gets sent to uh, back to my server, and I'll send it as a shown message and then as a clicked message. Now, as far as how you're going to do it, well, you could roll your own server, uh, but most people, it seems like, have already using Google Analytics, and Google Analytics seems to do just fine for this kind of work. Like I say, just wrap it up nicely. Now some variations. Um, one of the problems that uh, some people have with this sort of testing is what we call uh, slicing. For a major test, you may not want to test the same people uh, a big test one and big test two. You may only want, uh, you, you don't want to make, you want to make sure that you don't have some people in both tests. That's what I'm trying to get across. So in this case, I've taken uh, everyone that's in test uh, group B is unique between test one and test two. And this is what we call slices. So what you do is you create a collection of slices. In this case, I've got 20, but you could have 100 or 1,000 or whatever. And then you just mod it before you even do your test. This way, uh, you have so many pools that you can choose from for your major tests. Another variation is uh, called the multi-armed bandit approach, Epsilon Greedy. It's an interesting approach. In this case, it, uh, you have two phases, uh, usually a phase that's completely random, usually about 10%. You could go uh, and adjust that if you want to be more secure about it or more reliable about it. But most of the time, you're in what's called the exploitive phase. You calculate at that point um, which uh, test is the best performance based on how many times it's been shown, divided by how many times it's been triggered. And then you use the best test every time. This is a little bit of code that just walks through the same thing. My slides are online, so you can grab it afterwards. How does it perform? Well, this is how it kind of works out. We'll just walk through a few iterations of this. Um, let's pretend uh, that my data here is uh, we've got one showing and one triggered for each of them. That way I don't have any divide by zero errors. So at this point, both my red and my blue tests are the same. So we just choose red, fine. But the next time around, red was not chosen, wasn't triggered, so we're going to show blue. All right, fine. And it just kind of alternates. Now they're both uh, even, so red gets chosen. Red now is not doing as well as blue, so blue is chosen. And it'll alternate back and forth between these two. Well, now let's suppose we show red and it was triggered. Now you're probably thinking red will always be triggered from here on out. Well, kind of. At this point, red has a rate of 40%. That's higher than blue, so red will get shown. On the next time, well, red is still higher, but you can see that the value, its, um, uh, its reward is what they call it, is going down. So pretty soon, it's going to get to this level where uh, red and blue are now equal. So on the next turn, it's going to be blue. Now, uh, at this point, how it looks, if you just kind of continue to run the test and neither one of them are triggered, is you'd have two reds to every blue. 
So just because one person chose red, red will get shown more often, but not exclusively. It's pretty controversial. Uh, a lot of people seem to love it. A lot of people seem to hate it. They'd rather have a complete um, test over a certain amount of time as opposed to just immediately assuming that it's going to be good and let the test wear itself out over time. Yeah, your mileage may vary. Some uh, tools, uh, A-B testing is quite popular. You certainly don't have to roll your own. Um, there's a lot available. I'll mention three of them. Uh, the first is Optimizely. It's the big grill on the block. It's a paid for service. It's quite good, very nice, um, maybe a little too good. Uh, at a previous company, we had uh, quite a few non-engineers uh, using the product to start running some of their own tests. And uh, I think it took us a few hours before we realized that all the prices on our website were $129. Uh, we had to kind of roll that back quick and slap a few hands, obviously, but uh, yeah. Sometimes if you're not thinking through uh, that sort of stuff, it can uh, bite you. Another very popular one is uh, Etsy's Feature Project. This is a really nice tool system. It's quite uh, complete. Um, it's open source as well. Basically, everything on your website is a feature, and then you can either turn it on, test some of it, this sort of thing. Uh, it's quite large, quite complete. Another option is uh, Lab Rats. This is uh, one I put together. Um, it's much more uh, smaller, very focused on just doing this kind of testing. It's pretty straightforward. It's a jQuery plugin. Essentially, what you do is you create a couple of functions to uh, show off your test. Then your second step is essentially just to call it. You call, um, you call the lab rats function with the, the functions, and one of them will show up on some users, and the other one will get called for the others. Now, of course, these uh, functions here aren't what you should have. We really would like to uh, put some uh, reporting in those functions at this point. And uh, yeah, also make sure you can put in a name to make sure um, the tests are getting randomized between your customers. And if you have your own uh, ID, uh, Lab Rats will choose a, a random number and store it in a cookie. Uh, and keep it with the customer. But if you've already got an ID, you might as well use that. You can just put it right in here. It also has a, uh, um, the ability to put in a hashing algorithm so that you can kind of change what you'd like to use. The uh, default is just that very simple mechanism because um, I expect you to kind of use a different kind of uh, hashing algorithm. It takes a single key, so in this case, I've wrapped up the murmur hash in a just a, a, a simple closure. Now, sometimes you might want to only test some of your customers. You kind of want a big control group that gets ignored as far as that goes, and then a smaller subset that you divide by. It's uh, kind of easy. It has an option called off um, subset where you just specify just how many customers should be uh, part of this test. The control group could also have a um, a, a function, that can, a callback that can get called um, if they're part of the control. A um, few tips um, I kind of recommend. Um, don't test everything. You sometimes find that you get to a uh, happy, uh, minimal use that, uh, that's good enough, a local maximum. Uh, start trying to think about testing significant things first. Always um, uh, base your, t uh, your, uh, your test on sample size and, and, test, um, and calculate that beforehand. Uh, don't test on time alone unless you've reached your specific threshold as far as your data collection. Um, run your tests in parallel, uh, your test groups in parallel, that is. Uh, what I mean by that is don't test um, group A on one week and group B on the next. 
things happen maybe in the news and you may have different kind of reactions. Test them at the same time. You may also not want to surprise your reliable customers uh, with big major features. Instead, uh, maybe test those uh, really big site changes on customers that are just showing up, new users that show up to your site, not your uh, old reliable standbys. Also, uh, be careful not to put your users uh, or show your users the same testing on both groups. What I mean by that is if they show up on Monday and they see and they're part of test A, if they show up on Tuesday, don't put them in test B. Make sure that uh, you've got some sort of mechanism in place like cookies that will last uh, long enough to make sure that they only see one test at a time. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of people who've been talking about uh, instead of just testing your entire collection of random users, maybe target them. For instance, um, let's suppose you uh, want to increase traffic for uh, very attractive 45 to 50 men, 50 year old men. Uh, in that case, you know, target and test them um, instead of just testing everybody because, you know, it may be uh, much more effective. So uh, some of my takeaways, um, just uh, measure your experiments on how well they achieve your goals. Um, pick the right hash based on uh, uh, for separating your users so you've got uh, an equal distribution of your customers. Uh, make sure you report both your shown and your triggered, not just your triggers because you got you need to compare them based on how many times they've actually been shown. Um, don't stop your your uh, data with uh, don't stop your test without enough data. And uh, always verify your test with an AA test. And uh, feel free to fork and play around with the Lab Rats project. It's small and the code is pretty straightforward, so you can uh, actually play around with it. And then, uh, as in life, always verify your assumptions. Don't just assume everything works. So I'd like to have an experiment on you. I, I've done these talks a few times before, and I usually end the uh, with a screen of links that link to everything. In this case, I thought I'd try a QR since everybody's got a cell phone. That way they don't have to type. You can just uh, take a picture and that'll go to my website where I've got a list of all the links, including um, these slides you can download. Um, is there any questions? I know it's right before lunch, so. Yeah, um, that's, there's definitely a lot of tools to be playing around with. Um, I haven't played around with that one yet, so that's why I didn't mention it. But yeah, Google Experiments is uh, another testing tool that might be uh, useful. Ah. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the question was, his site would show up, the code for testing would then uh, adjust and shuffle things around and look kind of a little odd. Um, that's definitely a problem I think we always seem to run into with just about everything, not just in A-B testing. Um, what I've uh, often done is I've just hidden everything right off the bat. And then when the functions come on, along with changing the colors, the last thing they'll do is show it. So once that happens, everything is blank, and then you just, as, uh, as soon as the uh, JavaScript executes, then it can turn everything on. That seems to be the most effective way. Okay, thank you very much.